Hi there, this is Craig Beck, and we're about to go live with today's coaching session. If you would like to come on as a guest, either to get some free coaching or to talk about your own journey to sobriety, please go to www.craigbeck.com forward slash live. Okay, let's go. Hey, how are you doing? Uh, this is Craig Beck from StopDrinkingExpert.com. And firstly, apologies for the slight delay in getting started. Um, I'd love to give you a great reason, but my computer did that thing where just as you're about to do something really important, it flashes up a message saying, running update. <laughs> I was like, no, not now. So I've been sitting here watching the countdown timer for this update to install. It's finally done it, so I'll, I'll maybe I'll jump in here live. Um, so... Uh, if you want to come on as a guest, you can do. Just go to craigbeck.com forward slash live. It'll tell you how to do it. You can comment below, whether you're on Facebook or YouTube. I will see your comments. They will pop up here on the right-hand side of my screen so I can say hello to you. If you have any questions at all uh, about quitting drinking, about staying sober, about challenges that you're facing at the moment, then please post them up, and I'll do my best uh, to give you a good answer. I'm here as long as you need me to be. Uh, there's a couple of things I wanted to talk about today, uh, but let's just say hello to a few people before we get started so you don't disappear off my screen. Hi to Steve. Yay, you finally got my alerts working for live chat. Fantastic, Steve. Welcome on in. Uh, Marjorie's here as well. Hi, Marjorie. My mom's name, Marjorie, you know. Uh, Craig, love to tell you how much uh, you are appreciated. Three months sober, fighting with depression. Your Q&A with uh, Andrew Bridgewater was great. Um, yeah, we'll do that again soon. Uh, Andrew had quite a lot of people contacting him directly after that session um, for a little chat just to see uh, if he could help them further. And I know he's working with a few people um, who have gone through my course. So we'll get Andrew on again because I think it's really valuable. Um, hello to Fionula. Probably saying that hideously wrong. Apologies. Good morning from New York. Sober now since February the 7th. Fantastic. Thanks to you and your wonderful videos. I love Cypress stayed at the Golden Bay for four weeks, never wanted to leave. Is that the Golden Bay in Pila, in Larnaca? Yeah? Uh, very nice hotel. Uh, what else we got here? Um, hi to Jordan. Uh, Michelle, good morning from Nova Scotia. Oh, very nice. Um, the Silver Bullet. Hello, Craig. Welcome on board. Jim, the legend that is Jim, is here. He's been to 300 boot camps. Um, sobriety is amazing. Too right. Okay. So welcome on in, everyone. Uh, like I said, you can jump in anytime you want, and I'll try my best to answer any questions. I just think it's helpful to kind of do these uh, fairly, uh, fairly often. Uh, the thing I wanted to talk about was the kind of illusion that is being portrayed by the drinks industry that they are somehow our friend. Because lockdown is kind of coming to an end in a lot of places, not here in Cyprus. In fact, we've just gone back into full lockdown, which means we're allowed to leave the house once per day with permission. All the shops are closed again. Nightmare. Uh, but I had my vaccine yesterday, uh, so at least we're, we're, we're progressing. But in certain parts of the world, lockdown is being released, like in the UK, and the pubs are opening, the bars are opening again. And some of the alcohol companies... Uh, are trying to portray this caring image of the pubs are open again, so go and enjoy yourself, but don't forget to drink responsibly. And that's a phrase that you'll hear many, many times, and if you pick up any bottle of alcohol, you'll probably see a little logo on it that says drink responsibly. And I don't think a lot of people consider what this means or think about it. You know, it, at the surface, it can appear that you know, the alcohol companies care about our well-being and they're trying to advise us to live a healthy life. Uh, and I think that's got nothing to do with it because that little drink responsibly logo that you get on alcohol bottles and you now see on TV advertising for alcohol, at the end of the ad, it'll say drink responsibly. That is the bare minimum they could get away with. And as I understand it, over the years, there has been several consultations with health bodies, with government 
and state health agencies and the alcohol industry. And any time that the alcohol industry has heard that there is some research going on by a government body, they always pop their heads up and say, look, look, we're the experts in alcohol, so why don't you bring us in on the research? We'll even fund it for you. And so this is what has happened repeatedly. The governments around the world have done their research, but they always end up inviting in the alcohol industry. And what happens is these meetings always start off very amicable, always start off with the best of intentions. The alcohol industry says, yeah, don't worry, we're going to work with you. We know alcohol. We know our customers. We're going to help you get this message out there. And the same thing happens every single time. The health agencies say, right, well, we need to do this, this, and this. We need to raise the price of alcohol. We need to have a minimum pricing per unit on alcohol. We need to have explicit and graphic images on bottles. We need to advise pregnant women that they are going to seriously damage their unborn baby. And they say all these sort of things. And the alcohol industry at this point says, uh-uh, no way. And we're going to pull our funding if you go ahead with this. And basically, that drink responsibly message is the bare minimum that the alcohol industry would accept. And let me tell you why they have accepted that as a, as a measure. Firstly, because saying drink responsibly implies that the fault of this problem, alcoholism, is yours. You're the problem, not what's in the bottle. If they're saying to you, look, look, if you get into trouble with this substance, with this drug, it's your fault because you didn't drink responsibly and we told you to do that. So they're kind of, it, it seems like it's a really innocent statement, doesn't it, to say drink responsibly. But what they're actually saying is, if you have a problem, that's your fault. It's not ours. Don't blame us. Now, the other reason why they're perfectly happy to stick that little label on a bottle and on their adverts on the TV is they know that probably like 70 to 80% of their profits come from problem drinkers, the people who are drinking heavily on a daily basis. And they know that these people can't drink responsibly. It's not that they're choosing not to drink responsibly. They can't. So it doesn't matter. You can put whatever you want on the bottle. You can stick any label you want on there that is around willpower and around self-restraint. won't make any difference because, as we know, people who are in a loop with their drinking can't control it. So don't be under any illusion when you see these TV commercials going out now when lockdown is ending that the alcohol industry is in any way bothered about your health, mental or physical. They don't care. And they are very much like the cigarette industry was in the 60s and 70s when they spent a great amount of resource and time and effort denying any connection to the health problems of cigarette smoking, refusing to accept it. All the time, advertising, promoting, and making a product that killed its customer base. And this is what the alcohol industry does. It makes, promotes, and markets a product that it knows kills its customer base. That's you. So I think we're not there yet, but we will get to the point down the road where the alcohol industry is thought of in the same way as the cigarette industry, the tobacco companies are now. They're thought of as evil companies. When you think about tobacco companies now, you think evil, don't you? There's a company that makes products that gives people cancer, and they know about it. They know that their product gives people cancer, and yet they still keep making it. And, you know, and they, you might not see cigarette commercials on TV anymore, but, you know, they've switched their attention to other markets now. They're, you know, they sell single cigarettes in a lot of African countries. Here in Cyprus, even though it's not legal, you can buy single cigarettes in corner shops and news agents for like, I don't know, 25 cents, something like that. Why is that a problem? Because it gets people hooked gets people hooked on these products that gives you cancer. Same is true of the alcohol industry. This is an evil industry trying to disguise itself as being fun. And, you know, my whole premise of helping people stop drinking is changing the reality because that's why it's so tough to deal with this drug. And it is a drug because we live in the Western world in this bubble of unreality. And 
because alcohol is everywhere and because we have bought the narrative that you need alcohol to have a good time, you need alcohol to relax, you need alcohol to appear sophisticated and elegant, we've believed all the bullshit, then, you know, there needs to be people like me pointing out the reality that we're inside this bubble that isn't real. Because at the moment, if you're living inside the bubble, trying to quit drinking is a bit like going on a diet and living inside a cake shop. That's why it's so difficult to quit drinking. Because you're in this artificial reality that the alcoholic drinks companies have created and spent a lot of money to peddle and keep alive. I'm here to tell you it's not true. Uh, and to shine a big spotlight on their narcissistic, sociopathic behavior. Because this is an industry that kills its customers and it knows it's doing it. So that's just the, the main point I wanted to make today before I pass it over to you guys for any Q&A. Um, tell me what, what, what obstacles you're hitting at the moment. Are you coming out of lockdown? lockdown or are you still in it? And what challenges does that present? Is life getting easier? Is it easier to be sober out of lockdown, lockdown or in lockdown? What are you finding? And what helps? Uh, so please post up your comments and let me know. Let's say hello to a few more people. Uh, Todd, uh, Todd H, uh, hello from California. Uh, four months sober now. Fantastic. Um, last week I bought some THC CBC hybrid gummies. I take five, a five milligram gummy in the evening and I sleep great. Uh, am I breaking my sobriety? Your thoughts? Um, okay. So, uh, THC, uh, is legal in California. Yeah. Uh, so I, I'm, I'm not an expert in this, Todd. Do you get, do you get a high from that? Um, I think this is a complicated question. It's a complicated question because you know, some people say, well, I've quit drinking, but I've started smoking marijuana, and that, that's much better for me. It's debatable, you know, and I, I can never sit here and say to you, replace one addiction with another addiction. It's only healthy if you understand why you were drinking in the first place and you've dealt with it. Because like, like I say often, you know, 95% of the people who come to me with a drinking problem Alcohol is not the problem. It's just the symptom of a bigger problem. Hardly anyone is drinking because they just love the taste of it so much or because they're such a party animal they can't, you know, they can't stop. Normally, people are drinking because of some pain underneath that they don't want to deal with. And, it, it, you know, it's, it's, it's difficult to pinpoint because it's different for everyone. You know, it could be you're in a bad relationship and you can't get out of it. You're uh, in a career that, you know, it's, it's not what you want to do and you, you're stuck and you don't know what the next step to take is. It's trauma from childhood. It's boredom and loneliness or anything. There's something in there that's causing pain and upset. And rather than deal with it because, you know, it hurts to deal with it, we prefer generally to drink an anesthetic and make it go away. So... You know, if you've switched from alcohol to THC without doing any work in the middle of that, then perhaps you are just still covering up an underlying problem. The good thing is that if you're sober, if you've got alcohol out of your life, you now perhaps have the clarity to start work on these things. And I encourage you to do that because, you know, people have different opinions. Some people say if you've got, you know, health, mental health problems and you drink alcohol, well, deal with the mental health problems first. I kind of disagree with that because often the, you can't deal with the mental health problems because you haven't got the clarity and focus because alcohol is stealing it from you. So I would be predisposed to say get rid of the alcohol first so you can have a moment of calm and clarity and look at your life objectively and say, right, what's, what's broken? What's causing me pain? How do I fix it? So it's not a kind of yes, no answer. I know that, but rarely they are. Um, let's say hello to people. Uh, we've got uh, Ibanob. Is that right? From Australia. James Malik. Uh, thank God for you. Thank you, James. Appreciate that. Uh, let's see. We've got Aaron here. Hi, Craig. Has there been any research into whether non-drinkers have 
uh, less chance of being affected by COVID-19? Uh, well, I, I don't think so because we it's you know it takes a long time to set up a research project. Um, even if there had been, they probably wouldn't have had time to um, analyze the data. And you've got to ask the question: Is who's paying for it, and why? Why would they want to know that? Uh, the the only reasons to pay for that research were well, maybe the drinks industry would pay for it to prove, but they would only release the data if it revealed that drinkers were more protected than non-drinkers. And that doesn't seem very logical uh, because if you think about it, why would alcohol help you against COVID-19? It doesn't really make a lot of sense because... A, we know that alcohol interferes with the immune system. It weakens your immune system. It interferes with the absorption of vitamins and minerals. Uh, so it can only weaken you from the stance of, you know, protecting yourself against the virus. But also, you do stupid stuff when you drink alcohol because it interferes with the part of your brain responsible for making sound and logical decisions. So you always take more risks when you have alcohol in your system. And, you know, traditionally that meant driving a car while intoxicated, texting your ex-girlfriend or boyfriend, going on social media drunk. These are all hideous mistakes to make when you're under the influence of alcohol. But also you can do silly things, you know, not washing your hands, uh, not wearing a mask, just being sloppy with your personal hygiene because you're drinking alcohol. So I think it's, practically impossible that drinking alcohol helps you protect against COVID-19. It's almost certainly the other way around. I heard a really interesting stat the other day, which is quite shocking. You know, governments have their recommended daily amount of alcohol. In the UK, it's like 14 units a week, isn't it? Um, apparently, if alcoholic drinks had to pass the same standards that our food does, do you know what the recommended amount would be? It would be one glass of wine per year. One drink a year would be the recommended amount if alcohol had to pass the same safety standards as our food. Isn't that amazing? That's how poisonous this stuff is. That for us to be totally risk-free, one drink a year. That's crazy. I was shocked when I heard that, and I only heard it recently. Um, Lynn, Lynn McIntyre, blessings from Harrogate. I know Harrogate, Lynn. In fact, I had an operation on my hip at Harrogate Hospital about eight years ago. Very nice place, Harrogate. Uh, Sam Unstoppable. What if you drink because of shyness, social anxiety? How do you fix that in order not to drink? Uh, great question, Sam. Um, a lot of people drink for that reason, you know, because they, they feel socially awkward. They feel like they go to a party and they sit in the corner if they don't drink. The problem with using alcohol to help in that situation is it, it may help you a little bit in, in the short term. But then you're going to need to drink more and more alcohol as your drinking career progresses. And you're going to get to the point then where you're, you're drinking before you go out because you know that you won't be able to get the same buzz, the same sensation as you used to get from a couple of drinks. So now you're topping up before you go out. And it's a slippery slope. You know, you're, you're in a spiral to get the same positive benefit that you initially got, just a, you know, a drink of alcohol to loosen you up. Now you're having to drink more and more to get into the same position. And that's almost kind of incidental because the biggest problem here is you, you only grow as a human being, as a person, by exposing yourself to the things that you're afraid of. If you take a substance that makes it go away. You, you never expose yourself to the thing you're afraid of, and you never get stronger. You just get weaker because you, there's no way to learn. And, you know, I, I talk about the analogy of, you know, if, if I said to you, come on, we're going to go and jump out of an airplane, probably the first time you did it, you'd be screaming and terrified. The second time we did it, 
you'd be screaming and terrified. The third time, you'd be screaming and terrified. But how would you feel about it on the hundredth time? You'd be like, yeah, okay. I know how this goes. Now, the event hasn't changed. It's exactly the same thing. You're jumping out of an airplane. But your perception of it has changed. You're no longer afraid. And shyness and social anxiety is exactly the same thing. By exposing yourself to the thing that you don't want to do, by recognizing it for what it is, instead of saying, oh, I hate this, this is horrible, you go, okay, well, I understand that this is going to suck a little bit, but I know I'm, I'm seeing the bigger picture. You charge in and, and expose yourself to it. If you do that enough, you get to the point where you don't need alcohol to socialize. And you have a much better time because you haven't got an anesthetic in your head and you're not telling the same story over and over again, slurring your words and then forgetting what you've just said and saying the same thing again. You don't make silly decisions. You don't end up in bed with people that you shouldn't be. You don't say things to your boss that damage your career and all this sort of stuff. So you get all the benefits, but it just takes a bit of work. But we tend to shy away from the hard path. We, you know, As humans, we want to take the easy path, don't we? Uh, Siddharth, is beer equally bad? I can't control beer addiction. Um, kind of the, the type of alcohol you're using is, is irrelevant, really. It, it's sometimes we, we tell ourselves that we can't, we don't have a problem because we don't drink spirits. A lot of people say, well, you know, I only drink beer, therefore I can't be an alcoholic because if I was an alcoholic, I'd be drinking vodka. And, you know, my own personal story, I used to tell myself that I wasn't an alcoholic. I was a wine expert. I was a wine connoisseur. You know, I had a wine cellar with uh, <laughs> very expensive bottles of wine in there. I had, like, I had a, some bottles of wine in there. I think it was Chateau Lynchbarge as uh, a Bordeaux. There was like $400 a bottle. Now, at the same time, I had like, you know, 25,000 pounds on credit card debt. I was telling my wife, you know, you, we can't have a new car this year. We've got no money. I was telling the kids, we can't go on vacation this year. I've got no money. And yet I had bottles of wine in the wine rack that were $400 a bottle. What an idiot. And I had a little tasting journal. You know, I had a little diary and I would swill the wine. I go, oh, yes, that swills correctly. Make a note, sniff it, and, you know, write, what a wanker. <laughs> what an idiot. But it was all part of my the story I told myself, you know? I told myself that I wasn't an alcoholic. I was a wine connoisseur. And I, I kept that going for years. And that, that worked for me. I, I could tell myself that, and I had plausible deniability. So it's kind of irrelevant if you're drinking a six-pack of beer, eight-pack of beer a night, or if you're drinking two bottles of wine a night. It doesn't really matter because your tolerance is going to go up and you're going to end up drinking more and more and more. Look, here, here's the reality, right? When I was telling myself that I was a wine connoisseur and I was drinking one, probably two bottles of wine a night, the reality is this. If you drink one bottle of wine a night for 30, 40 years, you are going to reduce your lifespan between six and eight years on average. Nearly a decade of your life is going to be lost because of this behavior. Now, if you drink two bottles of wine a night, what do you think happens to your lifespan? Now, you might be tempted to say, well, that would be 16 years of your life, but it's not. It's 21 years. 21, 22 years of your life, on average, will be lost if you drink two bottles of wine a night. And that doesn't change if you're drinking beer or if you're drinking spirits. It doesn't make any difference. If you're drinking heavily, you are losing lifespan. And that's the harsh reality. Um, let's have a look what we got here. <laughs> Madeline says, can you ever see a time when there will be a non-drinking area in pubs? Uh, no, but because there's no, you can't passively drink, can you? I think you know, that's the main argument. Um, for uh, cigarettes that you can passively smoke. You can't passively drink. But there's something interesting going on. The younger, the younger generation are starting to turn their back on alcohol. Uh, you know, 
I'm 46. So my generation, we've been brought up with the kind of acceleration of drinking from between the 70s and now alcohol in real terms has got cheaper and it's got massively more available. You know, when I was like a kid, if you went to the alcohol sen- uh, section in a supermarket, there was like five bottles of wine and it was, it was all crap. You know, it was this cheap German sweet wine. There was really acidic, horrible French red wine. There was that uh, rosé from Portugal. What was it? Mateus rosé in the, in the bottle that your parents would turn into a candlestick holder. But there, that was it. You know, the, the, the alcohol section was probably, you know, a half an aisle. Now, if you go to the supermarket, they've got maybe three or four aisles dedicated to alcohol. So, you know, our generation, we've been heavily exposed to it. But young people these days, they've done some research. And something like 10 years ago, 15 years ago, they did a survey and uh, asked young people uh, if they would cons- – if they would dedicate themselves to never drinking. And something like 18% uh, of young people said, yeah, they have no interest in drinking, don't want to, don't like the idea of it, it's disgusting. And they did it again recently, and it's up to 25% now. So there is a kind of movement uh, of young people to turn their back on alcohol. And I think partly that is because drinking is no longer cool because everyone does it. Teenagers want to rebel, don't they? They want to rebel against the system. They don't want to follow what everyone else does. They want to stand out. They want to be individuals. Well, everyone drinks these days. So it's kind of hard for teenagers to state their you know, anarchy and rebellion by drinking because so what? So more and more teenagers are now actually rebelling against the system by staying sober. So I don't think there will be non-drinking areas of pubs, but what I think you will find is a dramatic escalation in the amount of alcohol-free options uh, that are available in pubs. And it's already getting pretty good. You know, go back 20 years, and certainly in the UK, there was like there was one alcohol-free beer available. It was called Caliber, and it wasn't very nice. It's still available, but I think they've improved it. Deb says it's easier to stay sober in lockdown. People make me anxious. People are the worst, aren't they? That um, I guess it's an individual situation. You know, some people are stuck at home and and they're using alcohol to deal with boredom. Um, so where are you, Deb? Are you coming out of lockdown now? Um, what else we got here? Oops. Silver bullet. How long do withdrawals last? Uh, Well, I'm not a doctor, and I can't give you medical advice. Um, You know, it's important that you understand that I I help problem drinkers, not alcoholics. And the difference between the two is that problem drinkers are psychologically addicted, uh, but they're not physically addicted. As in, if they don't drink, they don't get a physical response. They don't get physical withdrawal. Alcoholics have drunk so much and for so long that their body now expects alcohol to be in the system. They have become accustomed to it. And if they stop drinking, they have a very severe response to it. They shake, um, they vomit, they can't control their temperature. They, they're basically a walking wreck. Those people need medical supervision and assistance to go through the withdrawal process because it can be dangerous. Uh, so how long do withdrawals last? Well, you know, it, it depends really because a hangover is actually a symptom of withdrawal. So it really depends on you. But if you are having a physical response to stopping drinking, go and see your doctor and get some help with that. Don't do it on your own because in the best case scenario, it's going to be very difficult. In the worst case scenario, it's going to be very dangerous. So speak to a doctor about that if you're having a physical response. Uh, Let's see. Utsav, doing great. Good stuff, Utsav. Uh, Jose? I uh, wish you guys the best. It takes time, and it's a personal decision to not want to drink. For me, what's helped has been a desire for not wanting to drink. Uh, it's true, Jose. It's, um, you know, a lot of people come to my boot camp that we haven't done for ages now because of coronavirus, and I, I can see the suspicion in their eyes. They're like, I, you know, for 20 years I've had this drinking problem, and I'm sitting in this room with this British guy, and he expects me to stop drinking by the end of the day. It's impossible. How could it be that easy? Because 
it's pure mentality. You know, it's, it's changing your belief structure around the drug. Uh, because there are other options. You know, it's, it, it, there are better things to take than alcohol if you're looking for a high. You know, and I, I always make the heroin analogy that some people get upset about. But I say, you know, if you're drinking alcohol to get that sense of euphoria, to get that buzz, then take heroin. It's much better. Now, I'm not saying that go and use heroin. And the, my point is you don't use heroin and you find the suggestion obnoxious because your programming, your, your mental state around heroin is perfectly aligned. If you want to drink alcohol, all that means is your programming is broken around alcohol. You are looking at a serial killer and going, he's my best friend. That, that is exactly what you're doing. It's Stockholm Syndrome. You are looking at a serial killer and going, he helps me relax at night. It's not. It's a poisonous, highly addictive drug that kills 3 million people every year. It, that's it. And if you want to drink it, your programming's wrong. So that's what I do at boot camp. Um, so, yeah, you're right, Jose. It's a, it's a mindset. Amy Free, uh, one year today, so happy you're alive today, so I can say thank you, Craig. I'm happy that I'm alive today. It's always a bonus. Um, I don't doubt that I'd still be struggling if I didn't find you last year. Congratulations, Amy. Stick with it. Awesome. Uh, Scotty Riggs, uh, well, this is a nice surprise to wake up to. You're welcome, Scotty. Um, James, coming out of it. Do you mean lockdown? You're on the way out of lockdown. Lucky you. We've just gone into another full lockdown here in Cyprus. Uh, hi from Miami. Do you believe in tapering? Not really. Um, but I, I don't like to say never to anything, really, because as soon as I, as soon as I cr create a rule, it's going to make you want to break it. Uh, and that's certainly how I worked. You know, if someone said to me, right, you can never eat chocolate again. From that moment on, all I want to do is now eat chocolate. Um, maybe that's because I'm very stubborn and very, you know, um, <laughs> I don't know what the word is, but you, you get what I'm saying. Rules are not great for human beings. We don't like rules, really. So if I say uh, tapering is terrible, you must not do it. I, I don't think it's helpful. For me personally, uh, I knew when I was having my last drink, I went to the shop and I bought a half bottle of vodka and I knew that was my last drink. And I think I drank maybe a third of that half bottle of vodka and I threw it away. And I knew that the next day I wouldn't be drinking. It was just something shifted in my head. I didn't enjoy that last drink, I just, but I knew, it, I, knew I was having it. It's not like that for everyone. Everyone does it differently. Um, I, I don't think tapering is ideal because it, it just keeps the evil clown alive. It keeps giving him a little bit of power. And it, you're extending the amount of time that the, the drug has a physical ability to control you. Um, but you've got you to do what works for you. I can't give you an absolute black or white answer on that, I'm afraid. Uh, oh, lots of messages. Let me see. Mr. E, I'm at three days sober. The withdrawals are impressive. Okay. Do you, uh, that can only be a bad thing. If you're getting withdrawal symptoms, Mr. E, please go and see your doctor. You don't need to go through that. There's no, there's no need for it. You, you don't get a special badge for toughing it out. Get some help because you can get some prescription medication just to get you through that. And also it's good to go through withdrawals with medical supervision because it can be dangerous. Uh, see Lisa, good morning. You're doing a great job, Craig. Coming up six years. Wow, awesome. Um, hi, Becky. Becky Bolden, thank you for joining us, Becky. Stephanie's here. Uh, from Canada. Um, what else we got here? Louise Hall says, pink gin lollipops, jelly sweets like beer bottles, normalizes the poison, unfortunately, around children. It's true, though, isn't it? 
Do you remember? And do you know what? They used to do that with cigarettes as well. Do you remember? I don't know how old you are, Louise. You're probably younger than me. Most people are these days. Uh, when I was a kid, my grandparents used to buy me fake packets of cigarettes that had, uh, had candies in them that looked like cigarettes. They were wrapped in paper as well. And my grandparents, who both smoked, and smoking killed them both, would, would go to the shop, buy cigarettes for themselves, and then buy me candy cigarettes so I could pretend to smoke with them. I mean, it's crazy, isn't it? And can you imagine today if you went to see your friend who had a new baby and you bought them some pretend cigarettes? They'd be furious with you, wouldn't they? And yet today you still get alcohol-themed sweets and we've still got our way to go, I think. It's crazy. Um... Deb says, husband is talking about going out to restaurants again with friends. Uh, so we'll be at a pub, but not drinking. This will be my second sober summer. Excellent. Good work, Deb. Um, uh, Reyes, 30 days now, no AA. Um, no vitamin supplements. Doing great and healthy life. Whatever works for you. Congratulations on a month sober. Uh, Kelly, true. I drank for all of my boys. I drank for all of my boys, 25 or 32 years old. They don't drink uh, and are very supportive of my choice to stop. Thank you, Craig. You've been a huge part of my sober journey. Excellent. Well done, Kelly. Um, Bidyat, uh, seeing you after a long time. I've stopped drinking. It's almost 14 months, and my liver health has improved miraculously. I am almost out of fibrosis. Uh, thanks and regards. Awesome job. Awesome job. That You know... The liver will repair if you give it give it a chance to do so. Uh, the the problem with the liver, of course, is that there's no nerving nerve endings in the liver. So you know a lot of drinkers tell themselves, well, you know, if I ever get any pain over here, then I'll stop drinking. And the problem with that mentality is that you won't know you've got a problem with your liver until other things start happening, almost until the point where it's too late. You know, the, the liver will swell so much that it's pressing other parts of your abdomen. And you'll go to the doctor thinking it's something else and it'll turn out to be your liver. So it's it's a real gamble to have that mentality that if my liver ever, ever has a problem, then I'll stop drinking because you're probably not going to get the notice that you require to take action. And some people think, well, yeah, I could always have a liver transplant. But unfortunately... You know, there's a lot of people waiting for a liver transplant. And normally, doctors and hospitals insist that if someone has destroyed their liver through alcohol abuse, they demonstrate six to 12 months of sobriety before they're allowed to go on to the transplant waiting list. And, and unfortunately, if you've got end-stage liver failure that warrants a liver transplant, you're not going to live six to 12 months. Um, so it's you're kind of you're beaten by the maths. It's impossible. You never go, you're never going to get on that list. You'll be dead before the you know. So it's kind of pretty depressing. Uh, Melissa Jane, happy to catch the live. I haven't drank in three months now. You are a superstar, Melissa. Well done. Um, uh, oh, my screen keeps moving really quickly, and then I lose all the messages. Uh, Marjorie, great to have you on uh, in time here in the US. Um, Kate, I love reading about Stockholm Syndrome in your next chapter. Yeah, it's true. You know, I do think the people who believe that they love alcohol, it's the best part of their life, they're, they're suffering from Stockholm Syndrome. You have essentially fallen in love with a serial killer, and you, you can't see it. Um. Mod, what's your opinion on binge drinking? Many of your vids look at daily drinking. I'm interested to hear your thoughts on it. Um, yeah, you know, my books and my course, it's all about my story with alcohol. And I was a daily drinker, not a binge drinker, although I did binge drink as well. Um, Health-wise, binge drinking is actually worse for you than, than daily drinking. That doesn't mean that daily drinking is good for you. It is not. Um, that, that's another message that the alcohol industry 
tries to insist that the um, the governments of the world uh, send out the message that alcohol has health benefits. You know, there's a little bit of truth in that, but it's 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 pointless. It's like the health benefits of alcoholic drinks are not enough to counteract the damage of the poison. So what's the point in talking about them? It's like saying I've released a new uh, brand of bleach. You can drink it because I've put some vitamin C in it. So but that's irrelevant, isn't it? You're drinking bleach, Craig. So, you know, daily drinking and binge drinking, both bad for you. But um, from the point of view of ha health harm, binge drinking is worse. Um, kind of the quantity you're drinking and the uh, the timing of your drinking is irrelevant. It, it, you know, a lot of people come to me and they describe their drinking behavior. Uh, and I think a lot of people are asking me to listen to what they say and then say, oh, don't worry, you're fine. They'll say things like, I'm not sure if I have a drinking problem, but I don't think so because I can go months without drinking if I want to. And then I'll have a massive binge. And some people say, you know, I don't drink every day and I take a couple of days off a week. It's, it's not a problem for me uh, and so on and so on. The amount you're drinking and the frequency of your drinking is, is kind of irrelevant. The question you need to ask yourself is, is your drinking making you miserable? Are you out of control? Are you waking up with sensations of guilt and regret because yet again, you drank to a level that you said you wouldn't or on a frequency that you said you wouldn't, and yet again, you did. If your drinking is making you miserable, and if you're watching a live feed like this, and I would probably speculate that it is, then you have a problem. And... If it was anything else, you'd take action and, you, and you'd deal with it. You know, I think, I can't remember which book I read it in, but there's, there's a good little analogy. You know, if you found a fruit tree in a forest and you went up to it and you ate the fruit and it made you violently ill and you vomited everywhere and then you passed out and you woke up in the morning feeling absolutely terrible, you wouldn't go back and have another piece of fruit, would you? You would avoid that tree for the rest of your life, wouldn't you? Well, that's the kind of the analogy of alcohol. We're, we're continually taking fruit from the tree that makes us feel terrible and then saying, oh, maybe if I reduce it down, just stop eating the fruit is the answer. Um, Murray, how do you become a guest on your show? Just go to craigbeck.com forward slash live, Murray, and it should tell you how to do it. I will see you appear on here and I can bring you in. Um, we're probably going to wrap up soon, but maybe next time you come on, that would be amazing. Uh, let's have a look. A few more questions. Judy, 424 days. So, uh, alcohol free today. I'm guessing you have an app, Judy. Congratulations. That's really good. Um, Jeff B, I can get through the weekdays now as Friday rolls around, all bets are off. Then it's a repeat all over again, even though I'm so committed. Yeah. It's easy. It's not about willpower, Jeff. Um, Willpower doesn't work because even if you get super committed and you use all your willpower to avoid alcohol, you might be able to do that for weeks, months, and then something's going to happen where the evil clown in your head is going to be able to justify to you that now is it's okay to drink. You know, it could be something amazing. You some you win something, so the evil clown's going to go, well, you can celebrate this weekend. Or something horrible happens. Somebody close to you dies, and the evil clown's going to say, well, look, you're going to have to have a drink this weekend. You have to fundamentally change your belief structure around this drug. You have to fall in love with being sober rather than force yourself to stay away from alcohol. You have to be so in love with how sober feels that you're never tempted to go back because why would you spoil what you currently have and you adore? So it's, it's kind of willpower doesn't work because you're using a very weak part of the brain, the conscious mind, to fight a very powerful part of the brain, the subconscious mind. It's, it's, if you're using willpower to stop drinking, you are repeatedly turning up to a gunfight with a knife. You haven't got the right tools for the job and you you haven't really got 
much chance of winning in the long run. Uh, Cryfiston, a week sober today. Excellent. Keep going. One day at a time. Uh, Swapnil. So I've been sober for two months, but sometimes when I think about my past experiences and my parents who are no more as they were the, my biggest support in bad times, I get the urge to drink, to forget the past. I understand. Um, you know, I heard someone, someone said something to me very profound the other day. If you're beating yourself up about, you know, regrets of the past, things you did or didn't do, or people who you didn't tell them that you loved them enough and then they died and they've gone and things like this. It's time to let it go. It's time to forgive yourself because you don't know for sure that if you change your actions of the past, it would have made any difference to the outcome. You can beat yourself up about things you've done and not done if you want, but it, it serves no purpose because you don't know for sure that if you behaved differently, it would have changed the outcome at all. So just make peace with it, forgive yourself, and try and stay in the moment. Because as you know, the saying goes, if you want to be sad, live in the past. If you want to be for, uh, worried, live in the future. If you want to be happy, live in the now, live in this moment. So, you know, meditation helps with that. Hypnosis helps with that. Reading good books and getting your, you know, your spiritual state in a good place. Read The Power of Now by Eckhart Tolle. That's a really good book uh, to help you stay in the moment. Um, realist, day one again for me, really struggling to stay sober for more than a few days. I will be giving it my all from today. Any tips will be greatly appreciated. What are you doing differently, realist? Because if you're doing the same thing over and over again and you're getting the same outcome, that's going to carry on forever. You know, if, if your way of stopping drinking is to say to yourself, right, that's it. I'm not drinking anymore. I'm going to be good. I'm not going to drink anymore. Arrgh! And you're white knuckling it. You know, you're fighting with yourself to stay sober. It kind of sounds like that's how you're approaching it. And every time you do this, you fail. Well, guess what's going to happen? You've kind of proved that that approach doesn't work. So I would say to you, try something different. You can try and do my course. If you go to my website now, stopdrinkingexpert.com, you can sign up for the free webinar later on today, and I'll show you how it works. You can do somebody else's course. You can go to AA. You can go to rehab. You can go and get a therapist. You can try prescription medication. There are lots of different things. And there is not one solution that works for everyone. My course doesn't work for everyone. AA doesn't work for everyone. But don't keep doing the same thing over and over again and expecting the outcome to change. Do something different and keep twisting and turning. Never stop trying something new. Uh, Todd, you're correct about the anti-alcohol movement among the younger generation. In California, we have uh, cafes that only serve a big variety of non-alcohol beer and wines and healthy food. It's cool to see. It really is. Uh, you, and you're starting to see more and more sober bars. Uh, that's a really good thing. It, it just wasn't cool. When I was, you know, when I was in my 20s, they didn't exist. And, it, you know, you got ridiculed for not drinking especially for men, you know, it's this manly thing of saying how much beer you can drink is related to how manly you are. It's crazy, but that's how it used to be. It's true. <laughs> uh, what was that one? I missed that one. Jeff, Jeff Blue, they took my book of alcohol, lied to me, uh, off me while I was in rehab, 12 steps. AA was wonderful. Beck was the nail in the coffin, though. AA doesn't touch the science aspect. To have both has saved me. Yeah. I don't know why they do that, though. Why This is what winds me up about AA and the 12 step. Why does it have to be our way or no way? Because I think it's counterproductive. You know, to say to people there is only the way AA way to do it, this is the only way, is a huge problem. Because if you start off on that journey and it doesn't work for you, and let's be honest, it doesn't work for 90% plus people who go to AA. 
if you've taken that message to heart that this is the only way and you fail, then what does that say to you? It says you're hopeless, doesn't it? It, sends you, it says you're broken and you can never be fixed. How is that helpful? I don't get it. Sharon, I was on day one, four, three, and just had one. Back to the worst again before I realized what had happened. What's the way to get, what's the best way to get back in control? I really thought I cracked it. Genuinely didn't want it for so long, and now I'm back to square one. Sharon, it's such a common story. Uh, first thing, don't beat yourself up. This is not unique to you. And you're, you're describing the textbook relapse. I have so many people who get one year sober, six months sober, two years sober, something like that. And they're, they're continually telling me oh, how amazing my life is now. I've, I've, you know, I've rekindled my relationship with my wife or my husband. I have quality time with my kids. I have so much energy and passion. I feel better. They're so joyous about being sober. And then they go quiet. Then I get an email saying, I just thought I could have one drink at a barbecue. Or I went to a wedding and I tried some champagne and now I can't break the loop again. Because this is how it works. And this is why I say that the five most dangerous words you will ever think or say is just one drink won't hurt. If you ever catch yourself thinking just one drink won't hurt, I want you to punch yourself in the face very hard. <laughs> because that will be the last thing you think before something very bad happens that will take you months to recover from. Because you'll go back and you'll do what you did before, but it won't work. Why? Because now you have doubt. Now you have evidence it doesn't work. And the evil clown is going to jump on like this, like a crazy person. So you got to go back and you got to do it again, but you got to change some things. you got to bring in some new material and a new way of looking at, at that. Bring in stuff that you've not used before. Other books, you know, don't just use my stuff. Use Annie Grace, use William Porter, use AA if you want. Do something different. But understand that this happens very commonly and you will get back on track, but you just got to get that mindset shift back because at the moment you're despondent. You're doubting yourself. You're doubting the systems you've used before. Just dust yourself down. Don't make it a bigger deal than it needs to be and crack on, but change a few little things, all right, and get passionate about it again. It just needs that, it just needs that switch in your head to flip over again before it, it will come back. I promise you'll get there. Um, Operation Lull. I use AA sometimes too much. Uh, AA would drive me nuts. <laughs> yeah. There's a kind of strange thing about AA, isn't there? That, you know, you're addicted to alcohol. So three times a week you go and sit in a room and talk about alcohol. It's crazy, really, when you think about it, isn't it? You wouldn't do that with something else, would you? Like a different food substance. If you found you were eating too many bananas, you wouldn't then go and sit in a room three times a week and talk about bananas. It's weird. But it works for a lot of people. Emma, hi from Brisbane. Uh... Uh, Louise, yes, I remember the candy cigarettes, Craig. I'm only slightly younger than you, age 43. Uh, almost 15 months since I quit alcohol and cigarettes both together. Thanks for watching all your videos. Thanks so much. Congratulations, Louise. Well done. Um, what the hell is a sober bar? Uh, it's, a, it's a bar that only sells alcohol-free drinks. And they're rare, but they're increasing. Uh, what else we got? We're going to wrap up soon because we're nudging an hour, but let's see if there's anything left here. Silas, I've tried everything. I could stop drinking, but I just can't. I even stayed sober for a whole year. Uh, once I hit that bottle, I got back full force and now I'm deep in it. Again, really common, you know? You, you can't have, um, and it, look, change the drug. This mentality that you can stop drinking and then at some point return to social drinking is an illusion. And it, if you think that, it just means that you haven't really dealt with all your issues around alcohol. You still believe erroneous things about alcohol. You still believe there are benefits to drinking. And there is not one single benefit to drinking alcohol. You know, if you change the drug, you will see. 
You know, if you'd gone a whole year without sniffing glue, can you imagine if you said to yourself, I can probably go back to using glue socially now? It, it, it just doesn't make any sense, does it? You'd be like, that's crazy. It's just because we live in this bubble of unreality. Like I said, right at the start of the feed, we live in a world where alcohol is ingrained in every, every part of life. So quitting drinking in our world is a bit like going on a diet when you live in a bakery. You have to get your thinking straight. Otherwise, it's just going to be too tough. See, Lisa, open mind, read, read, read. Yes, so many wonderful personal accounts of kicking alcohol. Best wishes to everyone coming on six years for a fantastic job. Um, Percival, 200 days sober. Nice. Well done, Percival. Is that Tommy Cooper as your icon? Um, Alcohol-free drinks sound like the most ridiculous thing ever. If you don't like or want alcohol, why would you have drinks emulating alcohol? Drink water instead. I, I get where you're coming from. I think they have their place, to be honest with you. The alcohol-free spirits, you can get alcohol-free gin, alcohol-free whiskey, and they taste absolutely revolting. They're like drinking dishwater. They're absolutely horrible. But some of the alcohol-free beers, I think, have their place, especially if you're at a party and you're with drinkers and they're trying to put pressure on you. They're trying to, oh, just have one to be social, That you know, that sort of pressure. You can get an alcohol-free beer and stand there with it and nobody knows you're not drinking. And that, that's kind of nice not to have that pressure. But also, uh, I drink water all the time. That's the only drink we ever have in the house is sparkling water. And every couple of months, I have a little mental breakdown where I go, oh, God, I'm so sick of drinking water. I am so bored of drinking water. And in those moments, an alcohol-free beer is a real treat. It's like just, just to have a different taste, just to have something that tastes different to water. So I kind of get where you're coming from, but, you know, it has its place. All right, let's, listen, guys, I'm going to wrap up now because, uh, you know, I've been whistling on for an hour, but I'll do another one soon. Um, Jeff Blue, I'd love to have a Diet Coke with you in Crete. Uh, I'm in Cyprus, Jeff, but uh, I'll come over to Crete. It's a nice place. Um, uh, one more. Uh, Miss Pris, what's the definition of an alcoholic? I don't drink every day. I don't need it to start the day, but I do drink quite a bit when I drink about three, four days a week. And I only drink when I'm bored. Uh, look, the, the labels are sometimes unhelpful. You know, actually alcoholics are people who are physically addicted to alcohol. As in, if you stop drinking, you'll have a, a, a a withdrawal response. Problem drinkers may not be physically addicted to alcohol, but are using alcohol for reasons that are not social. And I believe if you're drinking because you're bored, you are a problem drinker. And that's not a healthy place to be because alcohol doesn't help with boredom. Alcohol doesn't help with loneliness or abusive relationships or work problems or financial problems, it's all an illusion. And actually, if you're drinking alcohol because you're bored, it's making your problem worse. Uh, and the analogy that I always talk about when people say, ah, oh, but I drink for this reason, is if you're, if you're drinking alcohol for any reason because you believe there's a benefit, it's like going to a loan shark to solve your financial problem. You will go to a loan shark and he will give you money. And in the short term, your problem will get better. But is it not true that in the long term, you now have a massively bigger problem? And if you keep repeating this over and over again, going to a loan shark to cure your financial problem, you will get into a spiral of decline. And this is exactly true of alcohol. If you're using it to get to sleep at night, to deal with boredom, to deal with loneliness, to forget about past trauma, you're going to a loan shark to cure your financial problem. If you want to know how you deal with this, I'm going to wrap up now, but why don't you go over to the website, stopdrinkingexpert.com, and, and sign up for today's free quit drinking webinar, and I'll explain it to you in detail. If you're new to the channel, hit that like button right now, hit subscribe, and ring the bell so you get an update when I'm live next.
So thanks so much for being with me today. It's been a pleasure. And uh, hopefully we'll speak very, very soon. Thanks a lot.